Hey friends, welcome back to Practical Bible Living, where we are studying the gospel according to John. We are in chapter 8, and today we're picking up at verse 31. So, now, the next few verses in our passage here, uh, where we continue from uh, the recent discussion, uh, they're so important, okay? These next few verses are so important, okay? And they touch on the importance of our freedom. Okay, our freedom that we obtain when we know and believe the truth. Okay, what does it mean to have freedom? What does it even mean? Okay, we're going to look at that today. In fact, you've likely heard these verses shared around because they're quite popular. Okay, this is such actually this passage is just wonderful to meditate on. Okay, it's just a wonderful thing to meditate on, and so that's what we're going to do today. All right. Now, the reason is this, okay? You see, many people today are held captive, okay, in bondage, and they don't even know it. They don't know it. Think about the many people, firstly, who prefer not to believe in God at all. They have no chance at all of being saved if they simply refuse to acknowledge that God even exists. Furthermore, How can they come to acknowledge Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God? Their only hope would be that God draws them to himself somehow, okay? Because if left to themselves and their own plans, it's pretty much hopeless. These people are actually in bondage, okay? Though they walk around as though they are free. And surely, they're able to find success in their work and they're able to take pleasures in all the things of the world, believing themselves to be sufficient without the need of God. You know, in my mind, I often think of uh, a lot of these folks as many people who are walking around inside a snow globe, like a large snow globe. You know those globes you see come around during Christmas time? They don't realize how small they are, or even we are, and how the Lord has his eyes and his hands upon the whole entire world that he created himself. They don't know that the Lord said he was about to shake up the heavens and the earth. He's about to shake it up. And there's a coming judgment. They don't know it. They don't perceive it. And so they don't understand the concept and principle of being saved and why it's necessary. They don't perceive it. And when it actually comes... They're going to be shocked and full of regret. But if you study the Bible regularly, you know that the Lord will, in fact, shake up the heavens and the earth very soon. Okay, And we have also the many people in the world who believe in God, but they are false gods, and they are not the one true God. Many people believe that there are many gods, even, and they worship God the name of many which are not even gods, but are likely even demons, and they don't realize it. Many worship the things they created with their hands, many idols, just as they did back then, when God was very angry with them. And then there are people who worship what they don't even know. Well, all of them are in bondage, and they don't realize it. Because they don't know the truth. Okay? That truth is that there is one God, and that God has a spirit whom we know is the Holy Spirit, and he has a son who is his very own word through which he created all things. The Father is one with his own spirit and his own son. They are one God, and we are saved only by believing that God the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, the promised Messiah of the Scriptures, who is His very own Word, in order to manifest to us in the flesh, okay, who came into the world to teach us wonderful things about God Himself and the kingdom of heaven and how to enter into it. And we know the many ways the Lord has made it clear. Recall from John 14, 6, chapter 14, 6, for example, saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
You see, he is the way, not a way, as in many ways, there is only one way, the way. In John chapter 10, verse 7, as our great shepherd, he says to us, he is the door of the sheep. And of course, so many places throughout the Bible, it's made so clear, more than we have time to discuss here today. But let the point here be loud and clear. Nobody is free or has any real freedom unless they believe and live for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is himself God. Because our bondage that we're in is the default. That's the default. Understand that. Without Jesus, we are already in bondage. Okay, recall from John chapter 3, verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see that? It's the default. We're condemned already if we don't believe. You see, it's the default. And although you may be living your life right now feeling as if everything in your life is perfect, a word of caution to you, my friend, everything is about to be tested through the fire. And as the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, the heavens and the earth will be shaken. And only those things that cannot be moved will remain standing. And that is the kingdom of God, which we will receive because we have believed in the only Son of God who suffered and died for us to atone for our sins. Okay, so let's dive into today's, into today's passage, beginning where we left off, now in verse 31. We read here the following. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. See that? He's talking to those who presumably believe in him. Note here something very important. Note here something very important. If we continue in his word, then we are his disciples. Jesus Christ is the Word, right? The Greek word logos, meaning the Word, whom John, who wrote this very gospel, says at the very start of this gospel, first few verses of the first chapter, saying that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He said, in the beginning was the Word, And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that's because it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He was present with God the Father from the beginning, and He is God because God the Son and God the Father are able to be different persons, but yet are one. Now, the Bible which is the Holy Scriptures combining the ancient but living books of the Old Testament where we learn about our origin, who we are, how we, got where, how we got to where we are, and how God dealt with all people, including his own. And of course, the many prophecies of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yes, this Old Testament combined with the New Testament, which includes the four gospel accounts, which are the four witnesses and testimonies of the life and fulfillment of Jesus Christ the Lord, along with the documentaries of church history since that time, with the letters that were written to the churches by the apostles, and of course the book of Revelation speaking about the time of the end, this New Testament, that Old Old Testament, and this New Testament, together being our scriptures, our Holy Bible, The Bible, this Bible, okay, is the perfect Word of God. And so the Spirit of God is actually present in these scriptures, literally and spiritually. Jesus said, my words are spirit. And so when we read the words of the Bible, 
though you may not be able to immediately wrap your mind around it to understand it, we are actually spending time with the Lord himself. He is present in his words. Now, I say all this to illustrate the importance of this verse here, verse 31. Understand that the meaning of, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. The original Greek word for disciple means a learner or a pupil or a student. And of course, this is the meaning of what a disciple is, hence the word disciple. We are students of the Lord. But how are we truly students of the Lord? Well, as he said, if we abide in his word, that means when we continue and live in his word, even the Holy Bible. How do we abide in the word of God? The Holy Scriptures. The Holy Bible. How do we abide in it? What does it mean? Well, the way that a student does, by studying it. You see, a student studies. Not just because they want to memorize a few verses. No. You see, the student desires in their heart to have understanding of the things of God. So they abide in it. Therefore, we understand then what this verse is telling us. We should be studying the Bible and studying it regularly as those who abide in it, and doing it yearning in our hearts to spend that time with the Lord and to gain understanding from Him and about Him. You see, that's what makes us disciples. Now, keep in mind that we are told that Jesus was speaking to those Jews who presumably believed Him. And so, this is even a message, okay, that He's speaking to the new believer. Or let's just say, The people who, to an extent here, believe what he is saying. And so, if you're a new believer, he speaks this to you also. If you truly believe and want to receive him as your Lord, get a Bible and be like a student. A student who wants to know who he is. This is so important because the world may give you all kinds of false advice and information about the person of Jesus Christ. But thanks to the perfect God, He has written everything down for us so that we cannot be fooled. See, He wrote it all down so that no one can fool us. And He has caused His Word, He's caused these scriptures, the Holy Bible, to be preserved for us to read until today for this very purpose. You see, this is the very reason that verse 32 Follows verse 31. Well, let's read what it says. Verse 32 tells us, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see that? You see, you shall know the truth because it's written down for you and I. But what does it mean that the truth will set us free? Okay, well, let's talk about this because it's so important. And few people really try to make the effort to explain it for our understanding. Doesn't it initially seem strange that this thing we call being saved, which by the way is the most important thing in our whole lives, but this principle about being saved is initiated by something as simple as believing? I mean, how does belief in something save? Doesn't that seem odd? It seems like something too simple. And believing is an inward thing. It's not really an outward thing. Not something that we're doing outwardly, which we're used to. But this we should know, that this simple thing of believing the truth is in fact a simple plan that God made for us. And by the way, when we believe the truth, which is an inward thing, it then does produce outward changes. Changing the way we think and the way we live, it changes everything, in fact. But God made it so simple for us that we, re- we really and truly 
believe the truth. Okay? He made it so simple for us. That's all we have to do to initiate this salvation that we receive from God, coming to Him and believing in Him. Why? Why did God make it something so simple as believing in your heart? Because from the perspective of God, think about it. God Himself, okay, there's nobody above Him. We're talking about God, okay, the creator of all things. And from His perspective, He sent His Son into the world to teach us the truth and then to suffer many things and to die for us as a necessary sacrifice that restores our relationship with God despite past sins and evils that we committed. Jesus Christ, having come into the world, was our solution and the saving of all humanity in all history since the beginning of time. Do you know anything else more important than this? And if you don't yet believe, then it's because you didn't spend any time at all one-on-one with the Lord asking Him about these things. And you did not open His Word to give, to give Him the opportunity to teach you and show you and reveal to you all of these truths, right? Because the entire Bible speaks of Him, Jesus Christ, from the beginning to the end. It speaks of this entire plan. So all this which the Lord was willing to do for us, by the way, this, my friends, is the truth. Everything that Jesus Christ has come and accomplished for us, on our behalf. And so we ask again, how could being saved from hell and being saved from eternal condemnation, which exists because of disobedience and sin, be as simple as believing in this truth? Well, now we should be coming to understand. How could we be saved if we reject all that the Lord did? We reject that it happened, or we reject that He did it for us, or we reject that the Father, God the Father, sent Him. As we see the Pharisees doing, we reject it without a reason. How should God receive that from us? if we reject the death of our Lord and Savior. So, my friends, believing in this truth is a big deal, okay? It's something that the Lord has thus set as a standard. You see, it's a must. It's a saving grace. And that is why we read in verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Because abiding in His Word and studying His Word as students, we become His disciples who know the truth. And because of this belief, because of our believing, we are no longer under the condemnation, okay, the condemnation that has been by default upon all people because of sin, which results in death and remains by default upon all them who reject the truth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you are a first-time believer, or it's your first time reading through the Bible, don't take this lightly. This is, in fact, the so-called purpose of life. This is it. This is the priority, and nothing else matters like this matters. Okay? This brings us to verse 33. We will reread the following. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? You see here how they respond to him regarding his desire for them to become free. Remember, you know, that's why he came into the world. He's trying to free them, trying to free us. But they invoke the name of Abraham, implying that Abraham is their father, and because of this, they are not a people who are in any kind of bondage. They say, how can you say to us, you will be made free? You know, they put their confidence in a man, 
And so we should know that there is no confidence in man, but we should put our confidence in God. Now, I spoke long and hard in the prior video discussion about this very thing called the fathers, which religious leaders hide behind as an excuse to justify their traditions and the desires of their own hearts, their own desires of their own hearts. So we won't spend too much time on that today, but do note that they think they are saved simply because of who they descend from or because of by whom they make as their earthly fathers. You see, they're blind to the fact that they remain in sin. Throughout the Old Testament, by the way, they had to keep sacrificing animals regularly because there was no good and perfect sacrifice that could permanently atone for their sins once and for all. And so they lived under the law and in the manner of those who are truly in bondage, with death being certain to all, both physically and spiritually. And when they died, there was no kingdom of heaven or heavenly paradise open to them. They were blind of what all their very own scriptures even attested to. See, that brings us now to verse 34 and 35. We'll read those together. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Now, we see that the Lord gives an example of what it means that we are already in bondage, okay? Especially to them who say they are not under any bondage, invoking the name of their fathers as though they are saved because of them. The Lord says, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. He's a slave of sin. So in other words, if we sin, we make sin our master, and we become its servant. Sin, by the way, is disobedience and is of the evil one. And if we are servants of sin, then we also partake of the same certain death and the same certain end. The same one to whom the evil one is destined. The same end that the evil one will receive. We don't want to go there. And it's really a simple concept. We are all under the power of sin and thus the power of death. And there are no fathers in this world who save us. Okay? There is nobody who saves except it is the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, who willingly fulfilled the will of God the Father in heaven, who finished the work which saves us. Nobody else. The Bible says there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Look it up. And interestingly, the Lord says in verse 35, which we just read, a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son does. The slave doesn't. He won't abide in the house forever, but a son does. Because in the context of slavery, the slave is not a member of the family. And so the slave has no inheritance. You see, if we are slaves to sin, then we cannot be the children of God. We are not of his family. And we must be in the family in order to have an inheritance. Now note that he says, the slave does not abide in the house forever. Key word here, forever. Because we are talking about a special kind of inheritance. A special inheritance, which is eternal life in the kingdom of God, which is the house of God. So we must be children of God as sons of God in order to be saved and inherit eternal life and live forever. And how can we do this, by the way? I mean, we speak about it here. Well, how can we do it? Well, let's see in verse 36, because surely the Lord gives us the answer. And so in verse 36, we read the following. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So, then, 
It's the Son, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who makes us free, and by believing in Him and what He did. You see, that's how. We ask the question, right? How can we do this? How can we be children? How can we be in the family of God so that we can actually have an inheritance from God to have eternal life? And so the Lord answers us. It is through Jesus Christ, believing in Him. That makes us free. That sets us free from bondage. We no longer become as slaves, but we become as sons. Okay? That's how. It's a matter of believing. And you cannot fake believing, by the way. Just so you know, you cannot fake believing. Okay? You can't fake it. God searches the minds and the hearts of all men. Of course, and women and children, but of all people. He searches the hearts and minds. And that's why he made this a standard. You see that? It comes from the heart and you can't fake it. If you really believe, it should be in your heart when he searches you. And believe me, he searches and knows what's in the heart and mind of all people, including you and I. You might be listening right now wondering if he's searching your heart and your mind, you better believe it. Absolutely. He knows even your thoughts and what you're thinking about this very moment. He knows. And there's also many examples of it throughout the scriptures. And also, let's just be clear once more. When you believe, it should be also manifest outwardly in your behavior and the things you do, and the way you speak to people. It should change you. There should, be, there should be evidence of it. Because when we believe, when we believe and give our life to the one true God, well, we must be born again. I mean, think about that for a second, because that's what we talk about often. There has to be evidence because when you believe and give your life to the one true God, you have to be born again. Which, by the way, you know, we discussed definitely many times because the Lord himself discussed it many times. And this means that we receive the Holy Spirit of God to dwell within us. Remember? We can even ask the Lord for his Holy Spirit And He desires to send it to us when we believe. And we abide in His Word. And we should see the evidence of the Holy Spirit within us because He leads us. You know, the Holy Spirit is within us, leading us. You see, guiding us. Doing work through us. Doing good things that are consistent with His goodness and His fruits. You know, but to get back here and summarize, The Lord makes it clear. He is the one who makes us free, and believing in Him frees us from chains that we cannot even see. And we are made free. Something you don't really know until you experience it and feel it. Now you should know, being free doesn't mean you won't have problems in this world. But know that the world is passing away, and all that matters is whether or not you will live forever, having eternal life, life in the fullest possible way, in the kingdom of God, which we should all be desiring and doing everything we possibly can to be found worthy to enter into it. Until the next one, have a blessed week.